So I apologize that you have to bear with me again. Um, but uh, Tom is in Australia and he might be joining for the Q&A afterwards. Um, but I'll give you the, um, the presentation that is called the Spatial Temple Politics of Wind, and, of wind Energy. Um, and it actually fits quite nicely with the presentation that we had um, as the first one in this panel. Um, and I would like to sort of make it a bit more complicated um, by introducing um, the initial thoughts or the, the framing that Tom and I developed um, for the case study that we're looking into. And this is, again, as we have one of the presentations by, by Gopal, um, as he said, is very much work in progress. Um, so we'd like your comments in the end on whether this makes any sense for you or not. Um, so, so as Eva already said, um, Germany, especially East Germany, is a quite wind-intense area. And um, the state that we're looking at, Brandenburg, is surrounding Berlin. And when you go out of Berlin, because most people just go to the capital, <laughs> um, you, any, any direction will do, and you'll soon see one wind turbine after the other. So the state of Brandenburg um, has held the so-called leading star for being Germany's state, being strongest in developing renewable energy three times in a row. And even today, Brandenburg has the third highest installed capacity of wind energy of any state in Germany, after two states in the West, um, with 3,825 wind plants installed, generating 7.1 gigawatt. Um, so if you stay in Brandenburg, a comparatively flat region, it is hence likely equivalent to having wind turbines with an eyesight. Um, it started in the 1990s um, as individual planned and uncontrolled development of wind turbines. And from 2012 on, um, it was controlled by law, by the so-called law for regional planning and um, lignite, uh, lignite planning. This allows for the designation of so-called wind eignungsgebiete, wind suitability areas. And it is since in the hands of regional planning bodies of Brandenburg to designate wind suitability areas. They also designate areas for farming, for flood control, but a major aspect is um, designating wind suitability areas. So it's in the end geographers who draw and publish maps, which are the legal ground for all building activities in Brandenburg. Um, this is from one, of their, from one of the regional planning bodies' presentations. So what they'll do, they have this procedure. They're really, I mean, they're experts, they're geographers. They have procedures involving the public, involving the polit politicians, and they draw these maps um, according to hard and soft factors. So this is one of their examples. Um, they have factors or criteria that say, okay, there's a settlement, there's a river, there's something that we you know, need to protect according to nature protection laws. We only have to, we can only have wind farms in a certain distance away from um, settlements. Then there might be, you know, birds, nests, and other stuff that also uh, restricts where you can put up a wind farm. So everything that might remain as a suitable area for wind energy will be this small piece, right? So it's, it's heavily um, regulated. Um, and Again, this is on the basis of a first of a political decision, a decision to install these regional planning bodies, then geographical planning, and eventually it's, it's landscape governance. And it is not in these areas that are strongest or most reliable um, for generating wind energy. Um, and this spatial regulation of renewable energy production collides with two factors. So one is the national agenda of fostering renewables in order to make the energy transformation happening and to reduce greenhouse emissions, what we had in the morning. Um, and it also collides with the profitability of wind energy production because, of course, people set up wind farms in order to generate profit. And this of the, you make the more profit if you have more wind uh, farms installed or wind turbines installed. So what we have in consequence is a high density of wind turbines in these wind suitability areas. So we have wind parks with <coughs> wind turbines up to 240 meters. Um, we have um, wind turbines in close proximity to each other. Um, and we also have places like, like Marquet, which is a small village, um, where this small particular village is literally surrounded by wind terms. So it leaves them no, it leaves them no space for whatever. So 
whatever direction they turn to, they have the wind turbines during daytime and then the blinking red lights at nighttime. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter where they turn to. Um, so the spatial politics of wind energy um, is that something I would like to add or we would like to add is as compared to other energy production, such as solar or coal, characterized by a situatedness between coexistence and exclusion. So on the one hand, we have wind turbines that allow for farming or residential living to take place in the proximity. This is why this picture is up. So you can actually do farming and have the wind miles, uh, windmills. Unlike, I mean, I never came, uh, came across any case um, where they're actually enclosed by a boundary. Um, it's, it's actually characterized by, by, by a possible coexistence, right? Um, wind turbines are often surrounded by fields generating profits for the operator as well as the landowner. Um, it's usually half a hectare that the turbine needs and it's compatible with farming as well as with residential areas. Villages and fields do not need to be devastated. However, the regulations that you saw before of wind energy production extends the radius for wind turbines um, as related to residential areas and the protection of nature. Hence, the spatial politics of wind become less ones of coexistence but of competition. It's not the spatial either or of coal mines, but it's sort of like keeping at a distance. And this keeping at a, at a distance leads us to the temporal politics involved here as another axis where further, act, uh, further factors need to be taken into the equation. Um, so the first factor is the introduction of these planning instruments constrain the growth of wind energy at a time when Germany's energy transformation actually needs to, to accelerate in order to reach the targets. This is what we also had in the morning that it's just slowing down and as Eva showed, you know, wind turbines are just like not put up anymore. Um, there's, there's various reasons for that, but it's a factor on the, on the temporal axis. It's like right now we would need to install more in, in order to meet our targets, but we just don't, right? Um, and the second factor is that um, protests against windmills are there, but what we would like to stress here is that they, com that they formed relatively late. As I said before, wind farming started in the 1990s, but there were hardly any protests in the beginning. It's just comparatively recent that um, these, these initiatives, these citizen initiatives have sprung up. And this is actually a bit contradictory because when you want to interfere or intervene into these planning processes, you need to do that at a really early stage and not when there are you know, already so many wind farms are there, the regional planning body is already far ahead in its process and then when it becomes too much, all of a sudden you know, these initiatives spring up. So we had already by 2010 almost 3,000 wind turbines installed and, and hardly any protest against it, but currently we have about 100 citizen initiatives in the state of Brandenburg alone. So there's a bit of a contradiction, and to some extent you could say it's this not in my backyard argument, that people say it's just too much, um, and, and we just see too many of them, and I don't want them right here. Like before, like in 10 kilometer distance, I didn't care, but now that it's like really close to my village, I, I really do care. But, but we say this does not suffice to explain that, that whole situation, because um, Tom um, interviewed one uh, member of a local citizen initiative and this initiative um, objects to the increasing scale and density of wind power in the countryside around the village but it's making that on the ground that it is an incursion into the forest so um, I'll just quote from, from this lady Susanna Boy who said quote this is such a dry region what they're doing to the forest here is really bad we're depriving the animals of their homes. We shouldn't destroy the protection of nature for the sake of protecting the climate. So this is a really, I mean, I'm really interested in how, how that issue plays out in other contexts as well, this like nature versus climate issue, which is, which is really strong. But, but they say, on the other hand, we're not against um, the, the, re, the energy transformation or renewable energies. We like really, we, we're concerned as well about the climate, but you can't play out nature for climate. So it's really, a difficult um, thing to tackle and um, I'm not going to repeat the concern focus um, of the specific local impacts because if I already said that right it's the blinking lights the the visual appearance and so on and so forth um, I just want to say that we had this they take to various forms um, so this is one protest um, protest picture um, that one of these initiatives sort of spread as, as postcards and 
saying pretty much, this is a one-way road. So um, saying it could be so easy, you know, this is just a general image of what Brandenburg might look like, but with all the wind farms, they're saying this is a one-way road. Um, it's, it's a dead-end road, essentially. It's a dead-end road. Um, so they take to various forms of um, protest that I'm not going to go into detail now. It's just one way is generating um, an audience. Another way would be political interference, legal actions, so various forms. Um, we just would like to say that there is that intertwinement of economic, uh, of um, spatial and temporal aspects at play here, which I think we need to bring together um, a bit better. But um, a last aspect I would like, yes, I do have time for that. Um, the last aspect I would like to mention is that the spatial temporal argument, um, considering landscape, considering the changing appearance over time, um, considering the, the density um, of wind farms are not sufficient to explain the politics involved. We rather need to go a second step or a step further and put forward the proposition that the spatial temple politics of wind um, form in close relation to differences between German states. And now it becomes a bit um, shaky ground, but um, the East German context extends the time frame for protest to form because the economic factor comes to the fore. People directly affected by wind farms were offered or demanded less economic participation in wind projects than their counterparts in energy regions in West Germany. Um, sometimes this is explained with less affluent individuals in the East German countryside. So as I said, they started in 1990, 1990s when the wall came down and then there were various economic processes at um, taking place, essentially giving, well, essentially creating quite a few people that are not as affluent economically. Um, and this is usually brought up as one argument why um, people in East Germany are not as much participating in the production of energy besides kind of leasing out their land. But we're saying that that's not really it. Um, we understand the financial aspects rather as a more or less strategic instrument to capitalize profits. Because, um, because the, uh, and also Eva said that, you know, these, these um, citizen energy forms are not very, you know, efficient or um, that they're not, that they can't be executed on a large scale. I would, I would disagree and say that they can be if there's will. There are low threshold models to, into, to integrate people into these community energy projects, but they're just not executed on a higher level. And I would not say due to the, not, uh, to, due to the fact that people are not affluent, but to the fact that there's no will to include these people. Um, so the economic, uh, the economic capital generated in renewable energy production is also related to expertise and advancement of knowledge. I mean, see, look at a farmer, he's not, I mean, how could you be an expert in the various business model attached to wind farms? You, you just can't, right? But if you come from a different background, say you have a West German background where you don't have to care too much about, put, put in whatever you want, um, you can have an advancement in knowledge and that might also give you a different position to negotiate with the investors of what particular model you might be putting in this particular place. Um, in Brandenburg, we often have the setup and harvesting, well, this is something Eva said as well, we often have the setup and harvesting of wind energy being done by large companies, which are often out of the state. And then she's absolutely right to say that it's sort of their decision whether they want to put the, for example, taxes into um, the place where the, uh, the wind farms are set up or not. Um, it is not in economic cooperation or majority shares or the so-called burger energy forms, including the local population. And in consequence, it took longer for the local population to gain expertise in wind energy generation. Further, there's another aspect, the reverse auctions. They make it very difficult for community energy to gain ground and small scale initiatives are less likely to enter um, this time and money consuming process of planning a wind park. So large-scale companies still have 
the major shares, and it's, yeah, it's something that could be crossed, uh, a line that could be crossed, but is not being done as of now. Um, just checking the time. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about the example that we're currently looking at. So we have one particular village where um, a larger company came in and said, we want to develop a wind farm here. They want to install 20, 29 windmills at a, and it's still at a very early s uh, planning stage. As you heard, it can take up to five years to actually put that process through because it's really complicated and you have assessments regarding nature and, and society. Um, and they presented their plans to the landowners as, a, as collectively orientated. So they had this 80-20 model saying pretty much all these owners of a huge patch of, of forest they would get um, their share of the revenue according, like 80% of the revenue will be shared equally among them. Only 20% will be distributed according to the precise plot where a windmill stands. So at a first look, it looks really, it looks really, well, yeah, this is a communicative, uh, a, a community approach, right? This is so like cooperative sharing. It's not that just one particular landowner gets, gets the revenues, but they will be shared more equally am among the community. But as I said before, there are other models as well. Um, and one of the incentives to actually propose this more equally um, approach is that the company, if they only have just one person who's saying, no, nah, I don't want to do that, because maybe you know, there's, there needs to be a road crossing um, towards the windmill. And this one person says, no, nah, I'm not going to do that, because I might not get like, the, the share from, or the revenue from this precise plot then the whole project might be less uh, beneficial economically, or it might not take place at all. Um, so this is a more solidarity-oriented approach, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, and yes, and a, a factor that we, as you know, coming from the social sciences, also need to take in, into account is that, especially in rural contexts, they have a, a tightly knit social network. So if you kind of not get everybody on board, it might be more difficult to actually um, implement these, these wind farm pro uh, projects because protests might form. So it's better to, to have them all together. To sum up, um, in the current situ situation, we see an increase of expertise in energy production and wind in particular. But other than expected, this leads not to a bettering of locals' position in energy partnerships, but citizens rather use it to target and stop wind projects. And all the government currently does is to finance experts who work uh, as independent moderators in the process. There are a couple of examples. Or it tries to cushion the unequal economic benefits by requiring compensations, um, measurements of compensations for nature, for the society, or as Eva pointed out for um, Mecklenburg, or as, as we are um, um, seeing in Brandenburg, um, a compulsory fee and it's actually 10,000 euros per windmill per year that needs, to be pay, that needs to be paid to the municipality, to the precise community affected. Um, but still, um, and in combination with the spatial and temporal developments, this might not be appropriate or sufficient to foster the energy transformation. Thank you. <laughs>